<clears throat> All right, everyone. Good to be with you again. So um, pardon my casual demeanor here. It is the weekend. It's Sunday and I'm just pre-recording a lecture so that you guys can watch it in the middle of the week. I got my Captain America shirt on, so I thought that was appropriate. Um, so I wanted to continue on with uh, your PowerPoints here. Um, <clears throat> let me share my screen so that you guys can see what I'm looking at. Here we go. Okay. I think we left off here last time, just sort of talking about New England. So I think I had said New England uh, today, certainly, uh, is the richest region of the country, longest life expectancy, highest standard of living. If you don't mind the, uh, the bitter cold winters, uh, it's not a bad place to live. You got Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, six states in the Northeast. And uh, that was all founded um, by Puritans, Pilgrims in the 1620s and 30s. So a little bit about them. <clears throat> First, there's, there is technically a distinction between Pilgrims and Puritans. The Pilgrims will be the first to come in 1620. I think I mentioned that in the last lecture that they tried to go to Holland, that didn't work, so then they formed a joint stock company and only about a hundred of them <clears throat> got on the Mayflower and settled in what's today Massachusetts. They actually aiming, they were trying to reach the Jamestown settlement and they missed and boy did they miss, you know, a couple hundred miles off. So they landed there and uh, they attempted to build a shining city on a hill as John Winthrop said. They signed the Mayflower Compact on the route over. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, they would be the more extreme of the two groups. The most extreme Puritans in all of England would be separatists or pilgrims. Not all Puritans were pilgrims. Most Puritans wanted to purify the Church of England to get rid of certain um, Catholic traditions that were still in this Protestant Church of England that they all read the Bible and could see there's nothing to actually justify. Now, some of this stuff is silly to us today. Catholics love stained glass windows. You would donate money to the church and you'd get a stained glass window put in the church with your name on it. <clears throat> and a lot of rich families like to do that. And the church would raise money that way by selling the rights to do that. Puritans thought that was just awful because they just thought that was vanity. It was sinful. So their churches were very plain. Puritan churches. Incidentally, Puritans, pilgrims, they do not call themselves this. Um, these were almost pejoratives. They referred to themselves as congregationalists. So I'll use that term later. And that, that's the official name of those churches, the Congregationalist Church of Connecticut, the Congregationalist Church of Massachusetts, etc. cetera. Um, so they hated stained glass windows. And the Church of England in England, run by Charles I in the 1620s and for a few decades afterwards, he was a Catholic and he wanted to keep some of these traditions. And so like a new stained glass window would be set up in these Puritan churches all over England and they would get so angry they would smash them in the middle of the night. Or they got mad because communion was being offered in what they thought was the wrong way. That the, <clears throat> um, according to Puritans, the uh, communion table had to be set up on the east end of the church facing Jerusalem. Um, who could take communion? Only those who were elect. You had to have testimony of two witnesses that you had a conversion experience that God actually revealed himself to you and said, you are elect, you are going to heaven, and then you could receive communion. Catholics give away communion to everybody because they feel it's an inclusive church. So, you know, some of these differences, they don't amount to much of us today, but they were viciously fought over in the 1620s and Puritans, pilgrims very much believe in it. A pilgrim is just a subset of a Puritan. It's the most extreme ones that are separatists and they're willing to leave England um, to set up these churches and practice their religion how they see fit. Puritans, the much larger wave, there was a wave of about 20,000 Puritans that come and they come about a decade later. They come in this period 1629 to 1643 and they are really more political refugees than religious refugees. <clears throat> the Puritans founded their own party in the parliament. They tried to challenge the authority of the king to get him to change his ways over these religious differences. So the king, Charles I, shut down parliament. 
uh, ruled by decree, locked up Puritans. His particular favorite punishment for Puritans, he and his Archbishop William Laud would have Puritans ears snipped. So Puritans would write these pamphlets saying bad things about the king. And if you got caught doing that, they would literally take sharp scissors and chop your ears off uh, and then release you. And that was kind of your warning and a warning to your community. Puritans retaliated by printing more pamphlets that speculated what were Charles I and, and Archbishop William Laud doing with all these ears. And so they depicted them as satanic figures eating all of these ears. Um, <clears throat> clearly there's no love lost here. They do not like one another. Finally, there would be a civil war in England that would break out in 1642, and that would spur a further migration. These Puritans just feel like my father's ears were snipped, uh, people in my family are going to prison for challenging the king, and we have to leave. So on the one hand, these groups are both political refugees and religious refugees, but the pilgrims are really more religious refugees. They left when times were relatively good. They just didn't like how the church was being run the larger group of Puritans who were a bit more mellow, they left because they were being persecuted for their political and religious beliefs. And so what happened is the Puritan colony <clears throat> of Massachusetts Bay would just envelop and swallow up Plymouth, the smaller one founded by pilgrims in 1620. But the, by and large, these groups get along because they're roughly on the same page. It's just a matter of degree of how much they intensely believe their ideas. Uh, New England um, is founded by uh, Puritans who, who migrated in their family units. It wasn't like individual men trying to find their own fortunes, like in Virginia, indentured servants and the like. It was entire families that migrated together. And so it grew much more rapidly than Virginia. Um, birth rates were very, very high, highest in the world at the time. And that's actually a sign of wealth. Now, nowadays, it's not. Nowadays, if you hear a country has a birth rate that's seven or eight children per family, it's usually poor countries where women don't have rights to birth control. Whereas uh, 400 years ago, a high birth rate meant that you had enough wealth and money and food to sustain a large family. And if you're a farmer, you're going to want a lot of kids to help you work the farm. And so you see very little intermarriage of the Puritans and the Native American uh, women. You see, you know, not much of a, an attempt to convert Native Americans because to Puritans, like, what's the point? We believe in the elect and, you know, you can't convert people. They have to get a message from God. God will reveal himself to the other people if, uh, if he sees fit, but it's not our choice to do it. Congregationalist Puritans were exclusive by nature, so they really didn't do that. Their mentality is that they would much rather have found a continent uh, devoid of any people even though the Native Americans do offer them corn and teach them how to cultivate it, and there's a bit of trade going on. What they want more than anything else is their land so that they can move westward, so that these large families, when they grow up, the children can marry someone else, get their own land of 40 acres, and move steadily westward and fan out all over New England. And uh, they were largely successful in doing that. There was much, much conflict with Native Americans, starting with the Pequot War in 1637, expanding further uh, in the century in 1677, or 1675 to 77, with uh, Metacom's War, King Philip's War. This is the largest war of this time period, because this constant hunger for land, and white Europeans would use land a lot how shall I say, just uh, they needed more land for their existence than Native Americans did who lived in much more harmony with nature. Um, and this led to direct conflict. Okay, oh, can I go to the next slide? Yeah, there we go, okay. So this economy would develop very differently than say the Chesapeake. In a single word, the Chesapeake was based on tobacco, just growing tobacco can't eat tobacco, so you have to export it, earn money, and then import all the things you do need. So Virginia and Maryland are incredibly dependent on trade with the mother country, with England. New England was a bit more independent um, <clears throat> in certain respects, and largely self-sufficient. They just, towns would sort of agree amongst farmers, right? Your farmer Johnson, farmer Smith is on the next farm over and you would plan your season with your neighbors. You would say, I'll plant corn, you plant grain. Uh, my wife will make the preserves, the jams and jellies this season. You'll grow apples. We'll make molasses. You'll do this. And then we'll just trade amongst ourselves. And pretty much every 
farmer in Puritan New England was a farmer slash tradesman. They learned to trade on the side because New England growing and harvesting seasons are shorter because days will become shorter in the fall in New England than they, they are in Virginia. It's colder in the winter time. And so you have this long stretch from November to April where there's nothing you can do to actually grow food or be a farmer. Um, and so instead you learn a trade, you become a cooper, a barrel maker, a silversmith, uh, a blacksmith, a, um, a printer, um, a tanner, any of these trades so that you could make money on the side. Some people became fishermen, some people just made parts of ships, they made ships mass, ship sails, the hulls of ships, some cut down trees and made lumber. So what you see is an economy that is multifaceted. You see an economy that's very diverse because they could not grow tobacco. That's so much easier to do. Let's just focus on one crop. So here's the analogy I often use is that the Chesapeake is much like Saudi Arabia today. Saudi Arabia's entire economy is just oil. That's it. They don't do anything else. They don't need to do anything else. They have all the oil in the world. Whereas many other countries, they have to get much more creative. Japan, for instance, doesn't have a drop of oil or mineral wealth of any kind. So they import sort of worthless things like plastic pieces, and then they turn them into computer chips, computers, automobiles, telecommunications devices, etc. They use technology and ingenuity to take relatively worthless stuff and manufacture it and then sell it. That's the Puritans, okay? Puritans often were called Yankees. Um, the term was not derisive at first. It is now amongst Southerners. Uh, and I think I mentioned that term last time, so I don't need to go over it again, but I'm gonna use the term Yankee to refer to any New England farmer, basically. They were very hardworking. They believed that um, idleness was uh, sinfulness, so that you should work, 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 and then one day you die, and then that's it. So they did not believe in fun very much. So you see a different attitude. The South was founded by people that were related to the nobility. So Southerners have these traditions like the fox hunt, the horse race, the barbecue. Um, they love music, and they come up with really good music. There's great antebellum uh, songs, pre-Civil War stuff that you guys probably would be familiar with today. Songs like Camp Town Races, Little Brown Jug, um, uh, many other ones, of course. Uh, oh, Susanna. It's a favorite of mine when I was a kid. Um, and these all come out of the South. Why don't Puritans come up with music? They thought music was sinful. You were supposed to work, and then in your time off, you were supposed to read the Bible and try to get into heaven and hope that God would reveal himself to you with a conversion experience. Imagine how depressing that would be, that in any given congregation, it's estimated only about 25 to 30 percent of the members were full members who had had conversion experiences and believed they were going to heaven. Everybody else waited their entire life, and God never revealed himself to them. Did God really reveal himself to these people? Most historians would say, no, of course not, but people might have had this deep experience where they believed that it had happened. Others witnessed it. They testified to it but it's a pretty stark existence in England. They, they don't really believe in having fun at all because that was part of their religion. So in America now, we have this sort of baked in understanding uh, called the Puritan work ethic. If you guys don't know, Americans on average work more hours than any other advanced country on earth. Um, we work just about 2000 hours a year. Teachers of course work a little less than that. We work about 16 to 1700 hours a year. We're more on par with how people in Italy, Germany, France work. Um, I think the country with the most days off is Argentina. They get like 45 paid holidays off per year because they have a very different culture. They come out of Spain where they, you know, they have the siesta hour and they, they value leisure. The Spaniards have this fine Catholic tradition. And this is uh, true of Catholics all over the world, whether you're from Mexico, Philippines, France, you believe in good food, you believe in living well and celebrating life and singing and dancing and enjoying yourself. Puritan said, no, 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 you can enjoy heaven in the afterlife. Right now it's for toil and suffer every spare minute. A penny saved is a penny earned, a great Puritan saying, waste not, want not, don't have any waste whatsoever, don't throw anything away, don't be frivolous with anything. Thrift, save your money and invest it for the future. Don't just blow it all on things that you don't really need. So this is why they didn't buy guitars and learn how to play them, what's the point, right? It's why they didn't really have horses, largely at all. Southerners did, because they like to race horses and they like to get on them to go do the hunt. Uh, whereas New Englanders said, what a waste of time, right? There's no point in doing that stuff. And it's sinful to go to a horse race, you don't want to do it. So. <clears throat> 
Um, but they had fine traditions. They built the first university in what's today the United States, Harvard. You might have heard of it. I just saw an article today in the Wall Street Journal that ranked all the best colleges in America. It's, they're always the same ones. Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Princeton, MIT, Columbia, the Ivy League, so to speak. And Harvard was at the top, at least for undergraduates. You get into graduate schools, it gets a little more complex. This is because Harvard has a $45 billion endowment. That means that when you go to Harvard, you're set, you make a fortune. And when you make that fortune, you write a check to Harvard. This gets benefits. Number one, it makes you feel good to give back to your you know, alumni association. Number two, you can get your kids and your relatives into Harvard much more easily if you donate a big check to them. And then they, Harvard takes that money, invests it, and then they can have the best laboratories in the world, the best research facilities in the world. Um, their endowment is almost twice what Yale's is. Yale's is just under 30 billion. So Harvard has a lead on everyone because they were founded almost 400 years ago. Um, and that was important. Southerners didn't build a single college till 1689, College of William and Mary. Yale would come about later in, uh, I believe, 1701, 02, something like that. That's in Connecticut. Yankees had now this rivalry, right? Harvard, Yale. Now we're going to have Dartmouth up in New Hampshire. All the best universities are going to come out of there. This, this belief in bettering yourself, self-improvement, a wonderful American trade, I believe. Although I do see the virtues of working not as many hours that we do. Um, we, of course, have this terrible moment in the 1690s. Uh, coming out of religious intolerance. Uh, don't be mistaken and think that Puritans believed in freedom of religion. They believed in freedom of religion for themselves. But if other groups like Presbyterians, Anglicans, that means people from the Church of England who actually believe what Charles says, um, Quakers were treated the worst because Quakers were pacifists and they would never use violence under any circumstances. And so they were treated miserably. You could not build your own church if you were Presbyterian, Quaker, Anglican, anything. You were forced to go to Puritan church until 1689 when the Toleration Act was passed. And we talked about that last time. The, um, the Glorious Revolution impacted that and changed New England a lot. Now you couldn't persecute people. But there's this um, book full of primary sources at school. I don't have it here and it's not digitized so I couldn't give it to you, but there's this article that I always have students read. It's a primary source of the punishments given to non-Puritans. And one of them was um, being put in the pillory. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but the pillory is that thing. You've seen it probably you know, in films or medieval times or whatever. You put your head and your arms through it and you're kind of bent over and they lock it there. They lock you in there for a day or two. Everybody in the courtyard comes by and laughs at you and kicks you in the rear end. And then your muscles sort of strain and atrophy and then you can't stand up for a week afterwards. You're in just terrible pain. Or they would chain you to a log in an outdoor prison in February in sub-zero temperatures. So Puritans, they are the opposite of the Dutch where the Dutch believe in hard work and making money, but the Dutch said, I want to make money. I'll make money with anyone. The Puritans also believed that God wanted them to sort of live their life and boss other people around to conform to their aspect of, of religion. Coupled with that, you have sort of a mass hysteria that breaks out in the 1690s. You have um, an Indian war that's going on on the frontier, Native American war, but in the book it calls it Indian wars. Um, and uh, this is not Metacom's war, this comes 20 years later. And what happens is there's a lot of refugees. There's a lot of terrified Puritans who there might have been a Native American attack on their village, their homes were burned down, and they all flood into Salem, Massachusetts. And so you have all these people who today we would say they're suffering from PTSD. And they're interviewed by all these families that take them in, and they're having nightmares, and they're screaming out in their sleep that they, you know, that they see the figures of Native Americans tormenting them. And so the Puritans all believed, because they were taught this, that people who said these kind of things were possessed by demons or spirits, or they might have been witches. Uh, the Bible claims that witches exist. Um, perhaps this is metaphorical, but Puritans did not view it that way. They believed that witches were women who had sold their bodies to Satan slept with him, so to speak, and in exchange, Satan gave them magical powers. They could create pestilence, plague, famine, drought, earthquake, hurricanes, whatever. And this was the Puritan's explanation for stuff. If you had a dispute with your neighbor, 
and then a week later your cow fell ill just for no reason and died in a day or two, you would say, I think my neighbor is a witch and they bewitched my cow. Now that you had all these refugees there, there was just mass hysteria in the community that there's witches everywhere. They just accused everybody of being a witch. Hundreds of people were accused. And this was something that actually was taken to court. And they have testimony at the time in 1692, 1693 over this. Hundreds of people were accused. 19 were executed. Um, and believe it or not, a dog was also accused and executed for witchcraft at this time. 18 of the victims were women, one of them was a man, and it was a shameful experience in our history, incredibly so. So we always mention the Salem witch trials to bring up this time in our life when our fears got the better of us and we lashed out at our neighbors and we accused them all of stuff. And this will come up time and time again in the 1950s during the McCarthy era, era. Um, you're a communist, no, you're a communist. This is when Arthur Miller writes The Crucible. The Crucible is about the Salem witch trials, but he wrote it in the 1950s to warn everybody, probably more dangerous than the Soviets is the danger that we pose to ourselves when we start letting fear get the better of us and we just accuse people without any accusation of doing wrong. And we still use this phrase today. You hear the president say it all the time. This is a witch hunt. This is a witch hunt. What does a witch hunt mean? It means that you are unfairly persecuted for various reasons and that people are making things up about you and trying to create this mass hysteria to just get the public to, you know, essentially uh, uh, take matters into their own hands, so to speak. Okay, so we got the Salem Witch Trials, a very shameful period in our history. Once you get into the 1700s, you're in the Age of Enlightenment. And, and I, I want you to understand, we as Americans, you know, descended from Puritan New England, we're not alone in having witch trials. They had them in Europe, they had them in the South, but it, it's very curious that there's sort of an explosion, a, a disproportionate amount of them in New England in the 1690s. It's very bizarre. They had them in other areas, but they were pretty rare and didn't happen that often. But this is part of our history. We did King, Will, uh, King Philip's War, I mentioned that already. Um, so I am gonna go down to the Glorious Revolution and by and large, we did this as well. This is a picture of John Locke. So the Enlightenment Locke's ideas of life, liberty and property, no taxation without consent. There needs to be a bill of rights that the divine right of kings is nonsense, that government rests on consent. We need to elect our leaders. Parliament should have more power than the king. The king should have fewer powers and a prime minister should be appointed. You guys should know the story by now. James II was hated. He would be deposed by William and Mary. And England has this once and forever revolution. This is what they tell themselves. We're so awesome. We had a revolution in 1688 and we never had one after that. We're still operating under that same constitution. And they've just sort of changed their laws a little bit ever after, still have a monarchy because they haven't changed. They haven't had a revolution since. Um, and in America, this is celebrated as well. And the dominion of New England is ripped up and, and those you know, six states in the Northeast all reenact their colonial charters and get rid of Edmund Andros, their Catholic overlord. Um, I won't spend much time on the Carolinas and Pennsylvania, but we haven't talked about them yet. So you have North and South Carolina in the deep South. Now we won't talk about Georgia yet because Georgia's the very last colony that's founded right before the revolution in the 1730s and 40s. Georgia was a penal colony, a prison colony where debtors, if you like owed too much money, they would send you there. Um, and so a lot of indentured servants, a lot of people who were in debt went there. Carolinas are very similar. Now the Carolinas are so far South that slavery looked different in the Carolinas than it did in the Chesapeake. Uh, it's a brutal system in both, but in Virginia, you can grow tobacco, but not rice. On the Carolina coast here, very marshy, very swampy, very good for rice. And rice, like sugar, generates an incredibly torturous, awful slavery system. So on the coastline in the Carolinas, you get these counties that are 95% African slave and like 5% free white. So the plantations are unbelievable in that you have like one white family with you know 10 or 15 people, a couple of overseers, and then you have this enormous slave population in the hundreds that will work the rice paddies because the weather is warm all year round. They can grow and cultivate rice all year round. And so that meant the labor was more brutal, the demand for slaves was higher, and the concentration of slaves was higher. The one colony 
that have more enslaved people than free people was South Carolina, which is just, it, it's unbelievable. 60% of the population was enslaved Africans and only 40% of the population was free white. It's not that way anymore because so many African Americans have migrated out of South Carolina. I think the last time I looked, there's 35 to 39% of South Carolina is African American. So it's less than half now, but still, this is the legacy of slavery. I want you guys to see that, that I just mentioned New England that barely had slavery because they couldn't grow cash crops. It wasn't because the Puritans were nice people. They would have had tobacco plantations and rice plantations and sugar plantations had the weather been accommodating in New England, but it wasn't. So they became, you know, lumberjacks instead or fishermen or whatever they became. In the South, the climate was right. So they exploited slaves to the, to the greatest extent possible. Now, in the upland country, as you kind of move in elevation up towards the Appalachian Mountains here in what's called the Piedmont, less and less do you see rice and you see more tobacco plantations. And if you really get up into the hill country, it's just yeoman farmers just, you know, struggling to get by. Same thing in Virginia. But I want you to note, as you move further south, the concentration of slaves gets higher. Where is it the highest? In the Caribbean and sugar plantations. Jamaica is going to be 95% African-American or Afro-Jamaican, you might say, black slaves. Um, when you go to Rhode Island and Maine up in the north, the fractions are tiny. It's like 1% or so. And I want you to see that still those statistics hold up. Vermont is a very, uh, lack of a better term, it's a very white state. It's most of the people there is like 97% white. South Carolina, Georgia, Florida have much you know, larger historical black populations. And this is a legacy of slavery. We like to think we have the freedom to just move wherever we want, but most of us stay where we were born and we don't migrate as much as, as we would like to think. Um, the next thing to talk about is Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania here, okay, the Dutch founded New York and New Jersey. We talked about that last time. Pennsylvania here is founded by Quakers. And to show you the story is very similar to New York, right? That in New York, Charles II acquired it. He turned it over to his brother, James, who would later be James II. But at that time, he was James, the Duke of York in 1664. James was given the colony of New Netherlands, called it New York. Similarly, here um, in the 1670s, Charles II acquired Pennsylvania. He just ordered that it be purchased from the Native American tribes that were there. And overnight, Charles became the largest landowner in all of Britain. Pennsylvania is bigger than Ireland, and he owned all of it, and he immediately sold it, so to speak. He turned it over to Sir William Penn, who would loan Charles a bunch of money. So that was to solve that debt, basically. Charles said, I could tax and pay you back, or I will just buy for a very cheap price from Native Americans this area. It wasn't even called Pennsylvania yet, but he gave it to Sir William Penn. William Penn gave it to his son, William Penn Jr., who said, I'm gonna do like the Puritans and try to build a city on a hill. Quakers are much kinder and gentler. Now, again, Quakers, much like pilgrims, Quakers didn't refer to themselves by that moniker. Their actual name is the Church of the Society of Friends, which is an interesting title. I've met several people from this church are the nicest people around. Here's the cool stuff about Quakers or Society of Friends. Number one, they, you might call them early or proto-feminists. They believed in the equality of women and men, not in all aspects of life, but certainly in the church. Um, second, they were anti-slavery. They were the first white people in the world to say that we should not enslave African peoples. This is di directly contradicted by the Bible. Other people would say, no, the Bible says slavery is okay. Well, you could find verses in Old and New Testament that say both. Um, and they also believed in fair treatment for the Native Americans. They said, you can buy land from them willingly, but we should not take their land and we shouldn't use violence under any circumstances. And they build this beautiful city, which becomes the largest city in the colonial world called Philadelphia, Greek for city of brotherly love, which I think is funny because I've been to Philly and Philly makes New Yorkers look positively charming. If you guys don't know, New Yorkers have a stereotype of being really mean and nasty, somewhat earned, the people in Philly to me are even more harsh and rough around the edges. I've been to Philly and I got yelled at a few times because I just wasn't ordering fast enough at restaurants. And uh, they're a little bit edgy in, in Philly, I would say. Um, but in any case, at the time of the revolution, Philadelphia had 30,000 inhabitants, largest by far. It was double the size of Boston. Boston only had 16,000 people at that particular time. Um, ben Franklin, very famously, he's a, a son of, of Philadelphia. And 
um, it becomes like New England multifaceted. It was known as the breadbasket of North America, lots of grain farms. Uh, and Philadelphia, as you can see, this is a river here known as the Delaware. And it basically divides New York and New Jersey from Pennsylvania, flows into the ocean here by Delaware, which is why it's called the Delaware River. And um, Philadelphia is right here, and it becomes a port city, the largest port city. A lot of goods coming in, coming out, a lot of trade. Um, no plantations, though, because you can't grow agriculture. Where can you start having cash crop agriculture? This line right here is known as the Mason-Dixon line. The reason that it's called that is when they first surveyed the border between Maryland here, which has slavery and has plantations, and Philadelphia or uh, Pennsylvania here, where it does not exist, this is roughly the latitude line where the day length and the seasons are just wrong to grow tobacco and you can't do it. The family on the north side of this line was known as the Masons. The family on the south side of the line was the Dixons. And so they still to this day refer to it as the Mason-Dixon line. It's the line between north and south. What's weird is that today the north has sort of crept into the south. Nobody anywhere in America views Maryland as a southern state anymore. Maryland is a blue state, very liberal, and migration has changed it beyond all recognition. It's, it's not a southern state by any, however you define southern, right? Country and Western music, they like NASCAR, you know, all that kind of stuff. Maryland is all intents and purposes a northern state, and so is Delaware. Um, Virginia, it's an argument. To some people, Virginia is the south. To some people, it's not. It's, it's pretty reliably blue now. Um, it's pretty liberal because so many young people like you from California have moved to northern Virginia because you want to get a job in D.C. and commute. And it's changed that area. To this day, this, the nickname of the South is Dixie after the Dixon family. So you might have heard that before, right? And, you know, Dixie this, Dixie. Dixie is just the nickname of the South, okay? Um, there was a, a, a minstrel tune called Dixie that becomes the unofficial national anthem of the South. And it's a very popular song. Again, the Southerners have this fine tradition of, of music. Um, so lots of... Uh, Immigration, tolerance, pluralism there. Pennsylvania, very diverse, like uh, New York and New Jersey, which were very tolerant and let anybody come in. The, the Quakers were really cool. They said, we don't care who you are, come on in. And they had, amazingly, by the time of the revolution, a third of all inhabitants of Pennsylvania were German ethnically and German speaking, which is rather unbelievable. Um, there were other uh, minority groups like Scottish and Scots-Irish Presbyterians who left Northern Ireland and Scotland and, and Northern England and came and settled in Pennsylvania. Um, I'd say the one fault of the Puritans, or not the Puritans, excuse me, the Quakers in Pennsylvania is that they were so tolerant that they tolerated intolerance. And here's what I mean by that. Rather than say, we hate slavery and we're going to abolish it and ban it, they said, we hate slavery, but we're so tolerant. If you want to own slaves, then you can't. But slavery looked like it did in a northern state where it was largely confined to cities, largely to ports, onloading and offloading things. Rich people in big cities might have house servants, but nobody really owned slaves on plantations because they had no plantations. They had, you know, corn and grain, which the economics is all wrong to actually buy a slave to do work for that. So you don't really see slavery spread into Pennsylvania that much, but it did exist in the big cities for sure. Okay. I think we're done with that. Let's start the new one. I would have liked for the old one uh, lecture to have encapsulated all that, but I was running short on time. So we'll move on to the next one. Share our screen again. Here we go. Okay. So we've had the glorious revolution. We've had, that's 1688. We've had, um, the Salem Witch Trials in 1692, and now we're starting to go into the 18th century, the 1700s, and what you will see is that immigration and population will explode in the 1700s. It's, it's rather interesting to look at the population of these colonies as late as 1700. It was very minimal. 10,000 here, 5,000 there. Not that many uh, English-speaking inhabitants lived on the eastern seaboard of the U.S. It is going to explode in the 1700s from both birth rates and immigration. So let's look at this. First thing to mention is that part of the reason the population explodes is because of slavery. This is our original sin as a country. We're still dealing with repercussions of this. It, it, you can't enslave a group of people for 250 years and then one day free them and just say everything's great and we'll all get along. You essentially are robbing 
people of one of the most sacred things, their labor, which they could never move forward and accrue wealth with, and you steal it and you get to keep all that wealth yourself. It's a very bizarre system. Now, white Europeans did not invent slavery. It was an institution that was very ancient. You know, the Egyptians of uh, you know, ancient Egypt used it. The Romans used it. The ancient Greeks used it. And um, medieval Europe did not. They got rid of it. They used a different system known as feudalism. Still a horrible system, but being a serf or a peasant was not quite as bad as being a slave. Peasants have certain rights. You have burial rights. You have the right to go to church. You have uh, the right of freedom of movement, actually. You can like, you know, leave and go to other plantations and visit, you know, relatives and whatnot. You couldn't be bought or sold. Families couldn't be separated. Um, slaves, no such courtesy existed. Now, one has to ask first, why enslave Africans? Why not just enslave somebody else? Well, they had tried that with uh, free whites uh, using indentured servants and Bacon's rebellion really put an end to that. They just felt that was too dangerous of a system. Expectations were too high and, and there just wasn't enough land to grant to every single indentured servant who got his freedom dues. Slaves had no such right as ever expecting freedom dues. Um, the second reason why Africans is that they had immunities to diseases Europeans had and there just weren't enough Native Americans um, to enslave, although Europeans did enslave Native Americans, make no mistake, they did do that, but it wasn't enough to sustain the economy that they really wanted. Um, and um, there are markets already. It's uh, one of these awful things uh, that in West Africa, um, like many places of the world, tribes would enslave other tribes. They would go to war with each other and they would take prisoners of war and then sell them off. But again, this was always a temporary experience for people, five to seven years or maybe one person's lifetime, but children would always be born free. Europeans, first the Portuguese discovering, and notice that slavery, African slavery, uh, first comes about in 1441. The Portuguese are buying slaves from West Africa when they don't even know the Americas exist. They're taking slaves, let me show you, from West Africa here, from Sierra Leone and Ghana and Nigeria and these areas, you know, Ivory Coast. And they are shipping them up here to the Canary Islands here and to Mallorca and Menorca here to grow sugar. So sugar is associated with slavery even before the discovery of the Americas. It will accelerate when the Spanish land in the Caribbean and the population of the Arawaks, the Native Americans there, what Spanish people called the Tainos, in just 15 years time after Columbus lands for the first time in the Bahamas, 99% of the population is, is wiped out, destroyed through pestilence, disease, famine. It's a horrible story. And the Europeans felt because sugar thrived there, they felt they had to have somebody come in. So they began purchasing slaves in huge numbers and shipping them to the Caribbean and to Brazil, of course, to grow sugar. Um, sugar cane is probably responsible for more human misery than almost any other commodity one can imagine. And it's kind of unbelievable because if you've ever seen sugar cane, it's a very unassuming thing. It's just a little green stalk and you wouldn't think that it, it could cause so much misery, but it did. I want you to note what these arrows represent. The width of them represents the relative size of the slave population that was brought, purchased, stolen, one might say, from Africa and then taken to the Americas. Notice that the width of the arrows is very big in Brazil and the Caribbean. It's very thin here in British North America. That's because records have determined that roughly 10 to 12 million slaves were purchased from Africa and brought to the Americas and about three quarters of them just between 1701 and 1810. That is the century when most slaves came. Not only that, but most of them, 95%, wound up in sugar plantations from Brazil to the Caribbean. Only about 5% or 600,000 went to North America. That doesn't absolve America from any guilt, but that's just to show you that demand was much higher for sugar plantations than it was for tobacco plantations, and here's why. Tobacco is much less labor intensive. It's an easier crop to cultivate. It has a season. The season's roughly April to October. And then for about five months, you can't do anything with it because it's winter and fall and early spring. 
Sugar grows in the tropics where really there are no seasons. If you guys have ever been to the tropics, that's why we go there on holidays is it's hot and humid every day of the year. So the sugar crop has no season. It's year round. Every day of the year, you're in the hot sun where there's no winter ever. It's just always hot and unbelievably uncomfortable. And you're out working there all day, planting, harvesting, and cultivating sugar, and then processing it because it rots before you can get it to Europe. You would go to the engine house and grind up the sugar and refine it into refined sugar. Europeans, having discovered this, and you guys probably well know, sugar is in everything. Sugar is in our salad dressings. It's in our condiments like ketchup and stuff. It's, if you ever saw that documentary, Super Size Me, I think they said there's about five things on McDonald's menu that don't have sugar in it. Um, it's like Diet Coke, water, iced tea. There's like, th that's about it. Everything else has sugar, coffee. If you get it unsweetened, just the black coffee. Um, everything else, bread has sugar in it. I remember the first time I saw my mother make tomato sauce from scratch. She was making like a marinara sauce. She put a spoonful of sugar. I said, what are you doing? We don't want that to be sweet. No, no, you know, you don't put a lot of sugar, but just a little bit, it brings the flavor out. It's in barbecue sauces. It's in everything. You put it in your tea. There are things that are totally inedible, like black coffee, unsweetened is pretty gross. It's pretty bitter. Chocolate, if you guys have ever had raw cocoa, it's disgusting, but you add a little sugar, all of a sudden it's good. Um, key limes are the most sour fruit in nature. It'll turn your mouth inside out. But you add a little sugar, you get key lime pie. Europeans were pretty much oblivious to all the misery that this caused, but their demand, insatiable demand to buy more and more and more and more sugar drove other Europeans who wanted to make money and had no morality whatsoever, buy slaves and bring them to the new world. Even worse than plantation owners were the slave traders themselves. This was a filthy, disgusting trade that, you know, even amongst slave owners, men that own plantations said, well, you know, I'm a gentleman, I take care of my slaves. These, uh, and I don't agree with that statement, but that's what they would say in their defense. But these men that just buy slaves and bring them here, they're just, you know, ripping babies out of their mother's arms. They're packing people into the hull of ships like sardines in a tin can. They're starving people to death. The Middle Passage, as you guys learned last year, was just unspeakable horror show of human misery. It's estimated that somewhere between 10 and 25% of slaves would die on this journey, given very little food and water, mostly given one crop, usually yams or sweet potatoes, because they have just enough fiber, protein, and nutrients to keep people alive and then you would get them to the new world and sell them off. The reason they did this was the profits were immense. If you could buy a slave for X in West Africa, you could sell them in the new world in Havana, Cuba, or Charleston, South Carolina, or New York, New York, for nine X, nine times your investment. And so they just did not treat these slaves very well at all. There could be a certain amount of loss. You wouldn't have this huge investment of taking care of them because the profits were so high which is perverse and awful and disgusting, but this is our history. This is our legacy, unfortunately. Um, so I think we talked about most of it there. So the differences between slavery and indentured servitude is indentured servants were white. They had a choice to sell themselves into slavery. They didn't have to go. And it was temporary, five to seven years, and children born of indentured servants were always free. Even though Europeans did not invent slavery, they invented the worst kind of it. This form of slavery is far worse than any other because you would be born into it in perpetuity forever. Um, you, it was not temporary. It wasn't for five to seven years. You had done nothing wrong. It wasn't like you were a criminal or prison of war. It's just, you know, you were sold to Europeans by your neighboring tribes in Africa. And uh, it was just hideous, disgusting. So going to the next one. So slave codes. Um, the slave codes written in the wake of Bacon's rebellion start to codify our understanding of it today, that only people of African descent can be slaves. The uh, race of the mother was important in the legality. If your mother was a slave, then you are a slave. If your mother was free, then guess what? You're free too. Um, the deeper south you go, the higher the concentration of slaves. So as I said, South Carolina was 60% slave. Virginia was about 25%. Um, and then you get up to, like I said, Massachusetts, and it's like less than 5%, okay? Because you can't have plantations up there. Um, because slavery wasn't as extreme in the Chesapeake as it was in the Caribbean, what you see is very peculiar. You see a slave population that more and more is what's known as Creole or born in America. So I want you to note this, it's, it's pretty fascinating. Um, 
slaves who were freed in America in 1865, 100% of them had been born in the United States. The Atlantic slave trade, the purchasing of slaves from Africa and being brought over, that ended in 1808. Congress abolished that practice. Now, slavery itself would still last several decades, but the Atlantic slave trade ended. That meant that by 1865, 100% of the slaves that were freed due to the Civil War were all born in the U.S., which meant they spoke a dialect of English very similar to the white population. They were all Christian, almost all of them Protestant, either Baptist or Methodist, the religion of their masters, because their masters would convert them. If you compare that to slavery in the Caribbean, for instance, Haiti has a revolution in the 1790s. Haiti still to this day is not a Catholic country. Why is that? Why didn't the French convert them? Because the slaves that rebelled in 1790, most of them, over 90% were not born in Haiti and practiced the religion and spoke the language of their masters. They were all born in Africa and had spent just a few years because, and this is gonna get really upsetting, slaves were literally worked to death in the Caribbean. Sugar was so lucrative and the profits were so high that masters were even more cruel about slavery in the Caribbean. Now, I don't want you to think that I'm saying something like, oh, slaves owners and America were nicer than the ones in the Caribbean. It has nothing to do with how nice the masters are. It really, it's just the perverse incentives of capitalism at times uh, or the slavery system or the combining of the two. And here's what I mean. A slave brought to Virginia would have to work probably 15 to 20 years before their labor earned the master enough money to buy another slave. So you had to quote unquote, take decent care of that slave. You had to make sure they got three square meals a day, that you didn't work them too hard, that you rested them. Plus the season, you know, allowed it that because it was you know, about a five month period where you're not working out in the hot fields. Um, slaves in Jamaica, because the profits were so huge, you only had to work three years or so before you generated enough profit to buy another slave. So guess what? Slave owners in the Caribbean just did not treat slaves well at all. They just barely gave them enough just to keep them alive, work them to death, and then bought new ones to replace the old. So there's this perpetual replacing population of new slaves arriving all the time throughout the Caribbean, Cuba, Jamaica, Haiti, Bahamas, Dominican Republic, all of those, and other areas like Brazil and other areas that we don't think of, like Central America grew a lot of sugar too. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but the populations of Eastern Honduras, Belize, certainly, Eastern Nicaragua, they are not so much mestizo, they're Afro-Central Americans, essentially. And they grew the sugar crops as well, and they lived under this awful system as well. Now, slavery is awful in Chesapeake as well, but the life expectancy was longer, the birth rate exceeded the death rate. So even if you shut off the purchasing of slaves from Africa going to Virginia, you would expect the population of slaves to increase, and they did. Whereas in Jamaica, if you cut off that new migration or forced migration of slaves into Jamaica, you would expect every last slave to die off within 10 years. The system was that cruel. And of course, slaves, we know this now, yearn to breathe free for years after slavery died out whites in history texts tried to convince themselves that this system wasn't so bad, that masters took care of slaves, they didn't have a worry in the world, they were like children, this was a paternalistic system, this is all lies we know, because we have records of slave revolts. There was a huge slave revolt in New York, you might say New York wasn't a slave state, well you're right, they didn't have plantations there, but they had slaves purchased from Africa, brought to slave jails in New York City, and then sold up and down the American coastline. And slaves there had a huge revolt in 1712. There was a plot to have a rebellion in 1741, but one of the slaves snitched and told one of his masters and it was you know, snuffed out of existence. There's a huge revolt in the Chesapeake in Virginia in 1730. There's isolated rebellions throughout the colonial period. And there's a big one in South Carolina in Stono in 1739. So this is to show you that Bacon's rebellion was not the last rebellion. That was the last white slave revolt. Now that there's no more, I don't say no more, but there's so few indentured servants in the South now, the people treated most harshly, the slaves would rebel. It's just there was never enough of them to make it like the Haitian experience where slaves were able to liberate themselves and declare independence. South Carolina might've been a case where that happened because there were so many slaves, but it was always snuffed out. And then after the revolution, the other states in the North would actually help South Carolina put those slave revolts down. So this is a very harsh legacy that we have to deal with in this country, but it is our original sin that and the 
awful treatment of the Native Americans. I don't know how people want to describe it, whether it was genocide or displacement or ethnic cleansing. However you want to describe it, it was shameful and terrible, but these are sort of our twin original sins that we still are atoning for and we're having to deal with it today. So the Southern colonies, this is an advertisement for tobacco in the early 1700s. Now it's not entirely accurate, but what is somewhat accurate about it is if you actually look at the picture, there's about five or six slaves picking tobacco, putting them in barrels. You have the slave owner here in his sort of, you know, 1700s aristocratic outfit, and he is selling the tobacco here to a merchant who is then going to take it to market and sell it. And tobacco plantations in general averaged about five to 15 slaves. They were pretty small endeavors. They weren't like these Jamaican sugar plantations where there were 5,000 slaves owned by two or three families. Um, it just wasn't like that. In fact, men like Jefferson and Washington and Madison who owned about 200 slaves each, um, they're thought of as rather quaint by the richest slave owners in the empire. Most slave owners in Virginia lament the fact that they have to do something else to make money. They wanna be a quote, absentee landlord. That means you are so rich you don't even live in the colony. You live in London and you have an overseer do everything and you can hire an army of overseers to run a plantation. Jefferson couldn't do that. He had to stay in Monticello. Okay, I'm not trying to create sympathy for Jefferson, but the point was tobacco didn't make the wealthiest slave owners. Sugar did. And who made even more money than them was the slave traders. They, they profited the most. Um, despite all of this, amazingly, the largest class of person in the South was still the yeoman farmer. In every colony but one, this was the case. In South Carolina, there were more slaves than free people, but most of the free people were yeoman farmers. In every other colony, the largest group was yeoman farmers. And so Southerners get kind of defensive of this because the rest of the country looks at Southerners that they're poor, they're backwards, they're racist. You know, are these stereotypes true? I would say mostly not, but their defense is often, hey, my family never owned slaves. We were poor. We were, you know, not men and women of means. You can't blame us for what a handful of planters did. Whether or not you guys agree with that, um, it is the case. And it's a misconception most of us have. Most of us imagine that these Southern states, everyone was a slave owner. Far from the truth, only a small class of people were and they would own most of the slaves. The average Southerner was like the average Northerner, a, a yeoman farmer. Typically though, they didn't have the work ethic that Northerners did and where they learned to trade on the side. Why not? because Southerners devalued manual labor. If you worked with your hands, guess what? You were no better than a slave. And so white landowners who were yeoman farmers said, I'm just gonna work to feed my family and make a little bit of the crop. And in the off season, I'm gonna enjoy my leisure time. I'm gonna get me a banjo and play some music. I'm you know, gonna drink some whiskey. I'm gonna have a good time with my family. They were Anglican. They were members of the Church of England, which were almost thought of as half Catholic at the time. So they enjoyed life. They had great food, they had great song, they had great spirit. The Puritans were just working all the time. And so there is this kind of cultural difference between the North. If you ever go to the South, um, the food is wonderful. Um, I went to Mississippi about seven years ago with my mother because I have relatives back in Mississippi and I went to the Cracker Barrel for the first time and it was amazing. I love the Cracker Barrel. Fried okra and tomatoes and collard greens and yams and all this stuff, you can't really even get this food, okay? The flip side of this is that in California, we have very good Mexican cuisine because we have a Mexican population in California. I've been to Kentucky, they don't have much of a Mexican population, but they're Southern and they have a lot of great Southern barbecue. It's very, very good food. So they're very different with that, right? Is that the stereotypical American food, if you don't count the South, it's casseroles, it's meatloaf, it's pot roast, it's food that's not very, you know, what I call Hoff's Hut food, right? If you guys like Hoff's Hut, nothing against you, but that's basically what's considered American cuisine. It's not fantastic. If you go to Southern cuisine, you know, Lucille's is what Southerners would call like a Yankees idea of what Southern food is. It's a decent restaurant, but if you ever go to Lucille's, it's a confused restaurant. Every page is a different type of Southern food. They have Cajun food from New Orleans right next to North Carolina barbecue and no restaurant in the South would ever have anything like that. But this is the tradition of leisure, sipping a mint julep, right? Going on the fox hunt. They love hunting in the South even today. They love their music. Southerners still have this weird tradition of doing cotillion. If you guys don't know this, Southerners are alarmingly polite, alarmingly polite. Like someone you just meet 
you would refer to them as Mr. This or Miss That. I remember just meeting full on strangers and they'd learn my name and they'd call me Mr. Todd or Mr. Osborne and this is just how polite they are. This is because Southerners were founded by people that were nearly noble or relatives of the nobility and they had that culture of giving people honorific titles, of hunting, of owning a horse and racing a horse. So if you ever go to Kentucky Derby and Churchill Downs in Louisville, Kentucky, you'll understand where that comes from. Ladies with big wide brimmed hats and you got the little binoculars that you like hold up to your eyes and you own a horse and you race it. Okay, that's the rich population, what I call the Colonel Sanders population. If you've ever seen those old foghorn, leghorn uh, cartoons on Warner Brothers, you know, where the people have these sort of Scarlet O'Hara accents and before they say anything, they utter the words, I say, I say, I do declare. And then they say what they're gonna say, right? I'm sure you guys have heard that. I say, sir, I say, I do declare. That's my pathetic attempt to impersonate a rich Southerner. You go to Savannah, Georgia, you go to Charleston, South Carolina, you hear that accent a lot. And they believe in good food, good music. You guys may not like country and Western, but I bet a few of you do. Probably went to Stagecoach last year and you know saw Jason Aldean and now you love country and Western. That's all born out of the South. Northerners really have no musical tradition until much, much later into the 20th century. And really who imports it is African-Americans leaving the South and the wretched conditions coming up North and bringing jazz music, ragtime, et cetera. And then all of a sudden Northerners start to steal from that genre and become decent musicians themselves. Uh, okay, so culture in the colonies. Culturally, we were a more conservative place than Europe, with a few exceptions, and one of those was just attitudes about land ownership. One of these things that was kind of interesting about America is we never had feudalism. Feudalism is this system where you have a dense population, a nobility, an established church, a monarch, and land is very scarce and very hard to get, and land is what generates all of your opportunities. And that mentality went to North America, but not the feudal system itself. In every instance when feudalism was tried in North America, it failed. And so they instead had indentured servitude and slavery. They had to confine their agricultural workers and prevent them from leaving in order to actually grow the cash crops that they wanted and needed. Land was so abundant and so cheap, quite often it would be stolen from Native Americans or, you know, purchases were made, um, that people couldn't believe it. I could be somebody, I could go to America and buy land. And so people do, and they climb that social ladder. Once you do own land, which most free white people did, um, you were somebody, you could vote, you could serve in public office, you had an honorific title, someone called you Mr. This and you got respect. If you lived in Northern Ireland, you were always going to be struggling and never gonna get ahead. If you go to America, it's the land of opportunity. It's not all roses and sunshine. That land had to come from somewhere and in large amounts it was stolen, but it benefited certain groups. Okay, whether that's good or bad, that's not for me to say. I will say though that there were some countries like Mexico where land was stolen and then it was just given to five or six people. As late as 1910, it's estimated that about 95% of, of Mexican people were landless peasants which is why they had a revolution in 1910. And uh, the richest 12 families owned the whole country and a combination of them and, and rich Americans who came down and bought up all the mineral wealth and the oil. Um, and here land was taken certainly and expropriated, but it was distributed not necessarily to the wealthiest people, but to anybody who wanted to purchase it. So that created a large amount of equality between people. Again, the largest class of people's yeoman farmers, the typical average median family from Maine through Georgia was a, a, a white couple that had seven to eight children who owned about a 40 acre farm and worked and did pretty well for themselves. Average person in England and France and Holland was a peasant, a landless person who had nothing and never could hope to break out of it. It's estimated that about two thirds of the white male population in America could vote, only about one third in Europe. And now immediately you guys would say, well, that's pretty limited on white male. Well, I want you to consider something is that today in America, we view almost everything through the prism of, of white versus minority and white privilege. And that's you know certainly a valid exercise because we're a multi-ethnic democracy. Here's my point is that 
it's hard for us to conceive today that there ever was a time where white men were oppressed. But it's absolutely true that in England, that's the only men that existed were white men. And most of them were oppressed. Most of them were peasants. They had no future. They were treated like garbage. There were no slaves or Native Americans to treat like garbage. So they just treated poor whites like garbage. And so they definitely benefited from coming to America. Is that right? It's not for me to say, but it's what happened. But it did create this consciousness in America that we still have to this day of upward social mobility. You ever heard the phrase, this is America. If you just work hard, anyone can make it. Lift yourself up by your bootstraps. And to a certain extent, that was true back then, and it's still true today, that we have a high degree of what we call social equality, where we feel we can criticize the rich, we can criticize um, people that are better educated than us. Um, and we really believe in, in the American, um, in the American dream. Uh, Europeans are very cynical about this stuff. If you ask America, uh, uh, Europeans, you ask French people, you know, someone who's poor and you say, well, if you just work hard, can you make it? And they roll their eyes and they say, no, the system's rigged against us. That's why we have strong unions because we just take what we want from the rich and we vote socialist. In America, socialism is like a dirty word. It's like, oh, there's only two people I'm aware of in the whole Congress that call themselves socialist. And that's Bernie Sanders and AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And to everyone else in the Congress, even Democrats, it's like a dirty word. It's like, ooh, socialism, we don't like that. We like capitalism. You just work hard and you can make it in America. You don't need to tax the rich. Um, I heard Marco Rubio, a, a Republican senator from Florida, say once, and it, it, he, whether he's right or wrong, he encapsulated the American mindset. He said, we are not divided between haves and have-nots. We're divided between haves and soon-to-haves right, is that even if you're poor in America, you often don't hate the rich because you see yourself as becoming rich. You're going to be a YouTube influencer, right? Once you do that, the money's just going to come pouring in. I want to ask you guys this. Uh, do you ever go down to Naples in the winter time to go see the Christmas lights or just at any time to go gawk at the rich people's homes, right? I do that sometimes. I want to ask yourself, how do you feel when you do that? Do you resent what the other people have and think that they got it unfairly? Or do you say, hey, that's cool. I want that someday. The average American very much, much more than anyone else in the world um, feels, this is cool. I want this for myself. I'm going to try somehow to get it. Okay. Whether that's good, bad, and different, culturally, Americans think more that way. And it's because in France, in England, in Germany, throughout the Western world, Feudalism simmered for a thousand years where peasants just hated the rich and resented the rich. And when feudalism ended, they said, let's form guilds and labor unions and make sure that we protect ourselves because we're not going to climb that social ladder. It's an illusion. In America, people really did come and climb the social ladder and become landowners. And so socialism never really thrived in America because of that. It created this different mentality, shall we say. Another thing that very much differentiated us from Europeans is the level of diversity. So this is a census taken in 1775, the last year of independence before uh, the revolution. And you hopefully will note, if you look at the breakdowns here, that fewer than half of the people present in British North America were actually English. A full one-fifth were African, most of those being slave and a small tiny proportion being free, but they are not English people. Scots-Irish, you guys might say, well, those are just English people or British people. No, they're not really. They don't get along very well. Um, they're people typically from Northern Ireland who are transplanted English people who live there for 100 or 150 years. They're not treated well because they're Presbyterian. And wherever they go, if they go to Anglican Virginia, they're treated like garbage. If they go to Congregationalist Puritan uh, New England, then they're treated like garbage there. Germans, those are almost all confined to Pennsylvania, but about 7% of all North America was German. Scottish, Dutch, French, Swedish, and we have other over here. There was even a small Muslim population in Charleston, South Carolina, and a small Jewish population in New York City. And so what this shows us is that America never really was uh, a country uh, of a sort of pure ethnicity, the way it was throughout Europe, because in Europe, they didn't really have immigration. You wouldn't move from country to country to find jobs because every place was overpopulated and every place was poor. And they had all these landless peasants with nothing to do. So why would you ever say, hey, England's full, but let's have more French people like pouring in? They didn't do that. European countries did not have an immigration policy until the 1970s. This is because birth rates drop off a cliff in the 60s and 70s. We used to have a birth rate well above three children per family 
In the 60s, it dropped down to about two, a little over two. And because of this, you would have a dwindling population. So the mature thing to do is allow immigrants to come in and it fills out the ranks from that 18 to 50 year range of workers who can pay into the tax base and grow the country. British North America was doing that long before anyone else. We get our sort of openness uh, to immigration from this British period. And it, it largely comes from a single law. Do I have it here? Yes, the Plantation Act, which is, I don't like the name, but that was the name. So we have to use that. The Plantation Act of 1740 has nothing to do with tobacco plantations or any plantations. They're talking about the transplantation or plantation of peoples from Europe. What the law said was that if you came from any European country and immigrated to British North America, you could naturalize as a British citizen. So get this, you couldn't come from say Paris to London and become a British citizen, but you could go from Paris to Virginia and do it there. And so thousands of people did. British government and legal system was about one of the freest in the world at the time, as bad as you know, we might look back now and say it was atrocious. Um, England was freer, had more toleration, had more rights generally than any other place in Europe, certainly more than Catholic Europe, Spain and France, Italy. Um, and so people took them up on that challenge. People from Germany, people from uh, Ireland, people from uh, Holland poured into the colonies during the 1700s, particularly the 1730s, 40s, and 50s. Population explodes in those three decades because of laws like the Plantation Act, where people come in. Um, we today just say, so what? It's a naturalization law. You guys have to understand that if you imagine a spectrum, believe it or not, and I know it may be hard to believe because the current administration doesn't necessarily seem the friendliest to, to immigration. Um, still, the Trump administration has not changed the law. The law says that we receive and naturalize a million immigrants a year, and that number stayed constant. People are still coming here despite the relatively unfriendly atmosphere. Believe it or not, it's still better than most places in the world. There are some countries that make no apologies and they just say, we don't want immigrants at all. And some of them desperately need it, like Japan. Japan's birth rate's under one child per family. If you guys have ever looked at, at these Japanese census charts, Japanese people are actually decreasing in number. There were fewer Japanese people in 2020 than there were in 2000 and fewer in 2000 than 1990. This is because birth rates have come way down so they only have about 0.9 children per family and they don't want any immigrants. The Japanese are just stubborn. They just say, no, it's virtually impossible to immigrate to Japan and become a naturalized Japanese citizen. If you marry someone who is, you can, but there's so much discrimination. Most families, they do background checks on their sons and daughters proposed spouses, right? So like a Japanese boy says, I'm in love with this girl. They'll hire a private detective to go look into the girl's past to see, are they Korean or Chinese? Is there some chance that they're not full Japanese? Because there's so much shame to the family if that happens. Now, in America, we have our problems, but we're certainly more open than that. Uh, in Germany, their largest population of immigrants comes from Turkey. They're Muslims from Turkey. And what's amazing to me is as open as the Germans are, they took a million Syrian refugees. I think that's great. I think we should have taken a bunch. But when you come to America, or when you come to Germany, excuse me, you can naturalize as a German citizen, but your children must go through the process as well. And their children and their children. And it goes on like that. If you're born of parents that are naturalized, you're not a natural German citizen. Ethnicity determines na native born rights, essentially. So in America, the 14th Amendment says, if you're born in the US, you are a citizen, no matter what. And that upsets people because some people are born here when their parents are not here legally. Um, but they're still citizens and can't be deported because of it. Uh, in Germany, it's very different. They just don't believe in that. In Japan, it's very different. In South Korea, it's very different, okay? Now, there are some countries that are a bit more open to immigration than those countries, but even in France, they, they have intense problems. They're not very good at immigration because they haven't done it very much. They've just done it the last 40 years. And I want you to note, uh, despite our problems, it, it's actually kind of bizarre, this makeup, and here, here's what I mean. Uh, there's a great um, African-American sociologist. His name's Orlando Patterson. He teaches, I think, out of Harvard. And he's probably the leading expert in race relations in America. And what he's written is rather interesting. It's sort of this weird dualism dynamic that's going on. On the one hand, 
Um, African Americans, if you look at any index of wealth or well being, there's tremendous inequality. More likely to end up in prison, less likely to have a college degree. It's, it's terrible. On the other hand, he writes that there's sort of a fascination of the white majority population with black culture and an embrace of it. That hip hop music is very, very popular with white kids in the suburbs and they, they buy it more than they buy music from white artists. That sort of the mother confessor of the country is, is Oprah Winfrey and that white folks love to go on her show when she still had her show and, you know, share with her. She's sort of this wise old woman who, who seems to be very worldly. Um, and it, uh, our fascination with athletes and, you know, the NBA and the NFL, et cetera, et cetera, is that uh, this is unthinkable. If you guys say, so what? You know, what does this matter? It's unthinkable in places like France, where they have not had a Black or a Muslim president. Most of their immigrants that come to France come from Algeria, from North Africa. And they're not really thought of as French, because French people feel to be French means to be white and Catholic and French ethnically. There is no American ethnicity. The majority population, as you can see from that, was English, but there's a lot that weren't. And now English has been, you know, stricken from our understanding. We just sort of lump everyone together from Europe and just say, you're white. I've heard, you know, my friends who are Hispanic, they will say, you know, um, they'll use this term Anglo. Anyone white in America is called Anglo, which, you know, my family would protest and say, we're not English. Anglo means English and we're not English. My family's mostly Irish. And they would say, we hate the English too. We hate them probably more than you do. But the term, you know, white American or Caucasian, or if you use the term Anglo, what that really means is any person, you know, from Europe. So it could be uh, Italians from New Jersey, it could be, you know, Jews from Brooklyn, it could be waspy Protestants from Connecticut, they're all sort of lumped together. Okay, it's very different than Europe, where ethnicity between countries actually matters. And despite our failings, still the US is very, very open to immigration. And what's interesting is actually, if you poll people, Americans are more accepting of immigrants now than they were four years ago, which is really interesting. If you poll people in 2015, 2016, many people said, we don't want Syrian refugees, the country's full, we should cut back on immigration. Now we're actually more open to it in the polls. Some people disagree with the administration, in fact, most do. So this is something to celebrate and be proud of. We're diverse and we've made America a land of opportunity for a lot of people. Um, it's easy to get down on ourselves because all these negative things in our history, but no other country was welcoming to Jews from Eastern Europe. The Tsar of Russia treated Jews horribly, miserably, and America let in over a million Jews from 1880 to 1920, and they have prospered in America. They've done very, very well for themselves. We gave them opportunities. We, it wasn't me, but you know, the country, the legacy of the country gave opportunities that they would have never had in Eastern Europe, and that's something to celebrate. Okay, on to the next one. So why the British North America really takes off in terms of population, in terms of its economy, in terms of its sophistication of a thriving society, it explodes in the 1730s, 40s, 50s, and it becomes this area by the revolution of 2 million people living in, in relative wealth. The average American was wealthier than the average European. Now the rich of Europe were richer than the richest Americans, but the average was higher in America than it was in England or anywhere in Europe. Part of the reason for this growth is this policy known as salutary neglect. This is Prime Minister Robert Walpole right here. And here's the dynamic of what's going on. There is a mad rush to control North America. The French want to expand and conquer the continent. So do the English, so do the Spanish, so do the Russians. A lot of people forget this, but the Russians had crossed the Bering Strait and colonized Alaska, British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and even Northern California. A lot of people don't know this, but that's why the Spanish built the mission system. Partially it was to convert the Native Americans there and dominate them, but part of it was to have presidios on the fortresses, essentially, on the coastline, trying to tell the Russians, don't come into this territory, don't come into California. So it was not clear who would eventually control North America. England had an idea, though. Now it's Britain after, uh, when is the merger with Scotland? 1707, I believe, is when it was. After Scotland merges with Wales and England, it becomes Britain after that. I'll show you guys this cool exercise maybe next time where we look at the flags of each and you can see where the Union Jack, the flag you see, you know, on Rolling Stones t-shirts and stuff. That really, it's just superimposing of the English and the Scottish flags on top of each other. And that's why it looks the way it does. 
Um, prior to 1707, it would have just been the English flag, white with you know the red cross in the middle. With the Scottish merger, it becomes Britain and the Union Jack becomes their flag. And this prime minister said the way to make North America become British and British controlled is salutary neglect. Just leave them alone, leave them through their own devices. Part of that's immigration. We need a plantation act so that we have more people moving and transplanting. The, the group that's going to control North America is the one that most successfully gets its population there and transplants themselves. Remember the French never could successfully do this. As late as 1754, there's only about 15,000 French people living in the French Crescent, whereas there were about 2 million British residents. 2 million is gonna defeat 15,000, no matter how many allies, uh, Native Americans you probably have. So um, what else? Don't make them pay direct taxes. Colonists didn't like that. And so Walpole said, you guys tax yourselves. We probably could get rich doing what the Spanish do and just pick your pockets and take 20% of whatever income you make, but we don't want to do that. You guys will control the continent for us. You will, whenever we fight a war, you will fight on our side and go attack the French and try to take a slice of their territory. Uh, and that's how we'll get you loyal is we'll leave you alone. We'll let you set up your own immigration policies, let you have your own governments. They'll just be royal governors appointed by the king, but you control his salary through your colonial assemblies that are elected by the free white um, landowners in your particular community. So politically, economically, socially, they just let colonists do their own thing. Colonists start to write their own newsletters. It used to be if you were a wealthy British colonist, you would buy the London Times and it would be like two, three months out of date by the time that you got it. Now, by the 1700s, Boston has its own newspaper. And then after Boston did, you better believe everybody else had to have one. Philadelphia had its own newspaper. And then so did Baltimore, Maryland and, and Richmond, Virginia. And then everybody had one. So this is a sign of sophistication. Did Mexico City have its own newspaper? No, the king wouldn't allow it. He didn't want anyone in the Americas having their own opinion. He wanted them to be told what to do and he couldn't censor things that far away. And so it wasn't allowed more direct control in the Spanish world. I want you to note that the Spanish empire starts in 1492 and it doesn't fall apart until the 18 teens, much later, 300 years. British North America starts in 1607 and the revolutions in 1776, much earlier. And the large part of that is salutary neglect, blessed neglect. Let the colonists do their own thing and they will be loyal and fight the French and the Spanish when we need them to. And it worked. In the short term, in the long term, it was a disaster because once the British started to rein in the colonies and try to say, no, you will pay taxes now, then we lost our minds and rebelled. Col colonial assemblies will control taxation and spending. Parliament did not take a dime out of the colonies. And Parliament actually gave a lot of advantages to living in British North America. There were a series of laws called the Navigation Acts, which were intense regulations. So, they're very complex, but here's a few examples. So Navigation Acts basically would say what ships flying which nation's flags could trade what goods and what ports, right? So it's like, okay, if you are on a merchant vessel, that's a vessel where you're just trading across the Atlantic, something like 60% of the crew has to be British citizens. Guess what? If you live in Massachusetts, you now have an advantage over everybody else who's not British to get a job. Um, only British goods could be imported into Massachusetts. So Anyone in the British Empire, guess what? That counts for you. When you're making lumber in Massachusetts, you get to sell that lumber up and down the 13 colonies and not compete with the French who are chopping down wilderness in Quebec and they can't sell it anywhere in North America. Those policies stimulated the American economy like nothing else. What's interesting is after independence, we see these cycles of recessions happening about every 10 years usually triggered by stock market crashes and then the panic creates bank failures and there's mass unemployment. The only time period where that's not the case is believe it or not, the colonial period. That's the only time where the economy grew every single year from 1607 to 1776. Farmers could always find markets for their goods and the British always took good care of their colonists. And still we resented them. In British North America, we had the largest electorate in the world a greater percentage of the population could vote than could vote in England or even Holland, which was amazing. And yes, we had slavery and that was wretched and that was awful. But feudalism was pretty awful too. And they said in England, if you don't own land, you can't vote. You're not a citizen, et cetera, et cetera. And 
most of the population, the vast majority were landless peasants, essentially in England and France. In America, most free white people were landowners and could vote, so that's something. The Enlightenment and all of its ideas of John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Voltaire, these ideas spread to British North America. People start to buy almanacs. Now, you guys may not even know what an almanac is. You're too young. Uh, now you just Google anything you want to know. They used to be these really cool books, and you know my parents would buy me them when I was a kid, and it just had all the basic useful knowledge, right? Like, um, what time does the sun rise and set every day at each latitude? So like they would record that in Boston, when sunrise and sunset for all 365 days of the year, and they would publish it, you know, in a chapter in the almanac. Who were all of the kings of England going back to Alfred? And they would publish all that information. Um, what are the constellations in the sky and how do they work? And when is leap year and how do you calculate it? All of that wonderful scientific, scientific information was copied down and transcribed into books and people bought them and it made them more productive farmers and better citizens. Most people could read in North America, highest literacy rate in the world. If New England was its own country, it would have been higher than even Scandinavia, which was the highest at the time. Keep in mind, 20% roughly of the population of British North America was enslaved and not taught to read and write, yet still our literacy rates were higher than in England or France or any European country which is pretty astonishing. This starts with the Puritans, because the Puritans believed, well, you got to read the Bible, so we got to teach you to read. And they were only really reading one book in the 1630s. As the Enlightenment rolled around in the 1700s, people started to buy other books. They, they had their Bibles, and they still went to church and were God-fearing people, but they also wanted to learn about astronomy and agriculture and banking and everything else, and they were voracious readers. Spain, the Enlightenment does not penetrate to that empire. You did not question the Catholic Church or the king under penalty of death. Salutary neglect in British North America. Let them read their little books. Who cares? All right, we talk about Harvard and Yale, highest literacy rates, newsletters, mercantilist policies help out. Now it's time to talk about the Great Awakening. So what was happening slowly, gradually, was that each generation was less devout and intense in their religious faith than the last. The people coming over in the 1620s were unbelievably religious. Their children a little less so, their grandchildren a little less so. By the time you get to the 1670s and 1680s, people born in North America, they don't care about Charles I. He was long since dead. They don't care about these fights between Catholics and Protestants. They don't really care about predestination and all these Puritan beliefs. And certainly by the 1720s and 30s, when the Enlightenment really gets going, piety or religiosity was well into decline. A lot had changed in 100 years. So the church has reflected that. First, Congregationalist Puritans had to allow non-Puritans to build their churches. So now there's, there's pluralism, right? You have your Congregationalist Church, which is the official religion in New England, sponsored by the state, but you also have Presbyterian and Quaker and Anglican and all these competing religions. So people who were forced to be in Puritan churches start to filter out and go to other places. Even the Puritans don't hold a majority, not 50% plus one. It's probably only about a third. Um, there's a lot of intermarriage between families of these different Protestant denominations and Son and daughter don't know which faith they want to be. Some of them don't go to church altogether. Some of them might pick the Presbyterian one instead. And so they became less and less and less devout. And the Enlightenment had changed people's minds. They started to say, geez, in this book in the Old Testament, it said that Joshua, to win the Battle of Jericho, stopped the sun in the sky so the day could stay longer so that he could finish his grand victory. And people thought about that and said, that's impossible. There's no way that the, that meant that the earth stopped spinning on its axis, that it must have crashed into the sun. There's no way that that ever happened. And so they start to say, some stuff in the Bible is actually factual truth. Some of it must be metaphorical. We're going to question things. And unbelievably, and this was, you know, what really created a lot of tension, was all these Catholic traditions that had been purged started to find their way back into Puritan churches. Congregationalist ministers started saying, let's just give communion to everybody, which goes directly against predestination. Now, most people just said, ho-hum, whatever, I don't care. This is how most average normal people behave when their leaders say, hey, things are gonna change. We're gonna stop doing this tradition and we're gonna start doing this one. Most people just say, whatever, I don't really care that much. Some people freak out though. It really disturbs them when 
forces of authority try to change things. And it was more with poorer people uh, all throughout the colonies, but particularly New England, who started to say, this is a betrayal of the faith of our fathers. John Winthrop is spinning in his grave. We can't give communion to everyone. We can't allow uh, all these practices like donating money to the church and giving a big, beautiful mahogany pew in the front row with your name etched in the side. That just seemed anathema to them. Puritans were supposed to hate that stuff. And so what happened was a lot of folks complained. They said, please change these practices so that we could go back to the 1630s. And by and large, all of these churches said, no, we refuse. People like these new changes that we've done. It's a kinder, gentler form of Christianity, people felt. And people then took it outdoors. Poor folks said, God has left this church. They went outdoors. They started following preachers like Jonathan Edwards and uh, George Whitfield. And they began saying, we're going to make our own denominations. So you have this phrase, old lights and new lights. Basically, it was the sort of newer reformed churches that were kinder, kinder and friendlier, and they were middle class, upper class people. And then you had poor folks that left that were much more reactionary. So the best way to really understand what's happening is the Enlightenment had really mellowed out religion quite a bit. And now came the backlash. If you guys don't know backlash theory, it basically goes like this, that as Martin Luther King said, the, mar the arc of the moral universe is bent towards justice, meaning that each year that goes by, human beings get a little better, a little more understanding, a little more tolerant of each other, um, better human beings, so to speak. But that's not entirely the case. Pretty much that's true, but then we often have these sort of backsliding events where we make progress and then people say, no more of that, we want to wind the clock back. A conservative typically likes to keep things the way they are. A liberal wants to push things forward. A reactionary wants to wind the clock back, okay? And there's people that think this today, that you know what? America was better in the past, 50 years ago, 70 years ago, whenever it was, and we need to make things more like that, right? Have you guys ever talked to your grandparents and they say, geez, in Long Beach in the 50s, you didn't have to lock your doors. You didn't have hard drugs out in the streets. You didn't have, you know, kids were more respectful of their parents. They didn't swear all the time. They listened to their elders. Uh, and now we don't respect anything. And I kind of get what they're saying, okay? I don't agree entirely, but I, I kind of get some of these lamentations, some of these difficulties. And so they try to latch on to their traditions and they try to look to the past as this touchstone of when their society was perfect. And that's what the Great Awakening was. It was this eventual backlash that exploded over all the reforms of the Enlightenment within the churches. It doesn't mean that everybody started believing in that old time religion again. What happened was the dialogue just got really loud and there was these shouting matches between kind of more liberal churches and conservative churches over the future soul of America. Um, and it was throughout the colonies. It was kind of our first national experience together where it did not happen in Europe. It happened in North America and it happened in every single colony where people went to preach outdoors and started talking about fire and brimstone and, you know, you're going to, you're gonna to get tortured in the, in the eternal fires of hell if you're not good. In the more mellow churches that had, had reformed themselves, they didn't talk like that very much. God is a loving father, he forgives all, etc., etc. Okay, and we are done, hooray. Okay, that took a little bit of time, but not too bad, about an hour and a half. So this week, pretty much you'll listen to, you know, lecture one and lecture two, and you'll answer the accompanying questions, but I thought, it would be good to kind of work independently this week and you can listen to these sort of pre-recorded lectures and hopefully it supplements. That's my goal as I'm going beyond the text to add more stories and anecdotes to, you know, hopefully uh, give a better understanding to what's going on. So answer the questions that'll be posted um, with this assignment and good luck to you guys. I hope you have a good week and I hope you're having a good Sunday like me. Bye.